Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. So today we are finishing our series on emojins. Everybody say emojins. And this is just a play off the word emojis and our emotions. So let's jump right into our message for today. So a few months ago, when I was going home from work, it was a Tuesday, which means that I work up until 3 o'clock, I have a short break, and then I come back for band practice. I went home to take what I like to call a Holy Ghost nap. Has anybody ever taken a Holy Ghost nap? They can range from five minutes to one hour. You open your eyes and your life is forever changed. It's those naps when you wake up and you're like, what year is it? <laughs> Who's president? Are we still in Vietnam? It's those real good naps. And as I was taking my Holy Ghost nap and I began to wake up from this nap, I was half asleep and my phone began to vibrate. Now I, wanna, I want us to understand something. When we are half asleep, our brains are amazing at creating horrible scenarios and reading things that aren't that bad as if they're the worst thing ever. I get this text that simply says this with no context. This text says, Pastor Josh, we messed up big time with a teenager. Now, mind you, I'm the executive pastor here, but I also oversee the youth ministry. So if there's an issue with the youth, guess whose head it's on? It's on me because I'm responsible for it. So I get this text that says, we messed up big time with a teenager. Immediately, I begin to think, did, did I say something wrong to the teens? Did Pastor Mike figure out that I was waving around a knife during service? True story. A few months ago, I did that. Did he figure out that I filled the baptism tank with nacho cheese? Not a true story. I would not be speaking if I did that today. But what happened? I begin to go through my mind like, what did I do that was so bad that I messed up a teenager or offended somebody, hurt a family? So now I'm beginning to get a little bit anxious. I feel a little bit anxious because I'm hearing that there was an issue. So I try to get a little bit more calm, so I text the person back, what happened? I'm trying to get some clarity so that I'm not feeling as anxious as stressed. And this person is just rapid texting me. Anybody here a rapid texter? You can't send a nice paragraph. You just say, hey, just so you know, I want to say, and you just keep sending. This person is rapid texting me. I asked for clarity to reduce my anxiety. You know what the next rapid fire text says? Pastor Mike has already been contacted. <sighs> so I'm like, okay, so if it's $600 a week from the COVID unemployment, and I go ahead and I start a groundhog ministry for the, uh, the forgotten groundhogs, maybe then I can make it in life. So now I go from having this nice Holy Ghost nap to being full of anxiety. Now my heart begins to beat faster. Now I begin to sweat. My nap, I feel like, is ruined all because of two small text messages. I gave these two small text messages power over my mind. The way that I was sweating and anxious, I gave two small texts power over my body. When I received the text message, I was half asleep, half awake. Now I was half awake, 25% asleep, and 25% dying inside. <laughs> All these thoughts going through my head, I said, what did I do? Now I'm full of anxiety. As I was researching the word anxiety and where it comes from and what it means, anxiety at its root, its first root, means to be greatly troubled by uncertainty. Anybody ever feel greatly troubled by uncertainty? Anybody thinking about that uncertainty right now? And as I look deeper into this word anxiety, it comes from the Latin phrase anguir, which means to choke or to squeeze. Anxiety isn't just a feeling in our minds, but it literally feels sometimes like we're being choked or squeezed by anxiety. Maybe you've felt this way before. You felt the squeeze of anxiety. 
my heart rate is up, I'm sweating, the text messages keep coming through, and I say, you know what? I'm just going to put down my phone and leave this until tomorrow because these reassuring text messages are not helping me at all. I'm only feeling worse. I lay back down, can't fall asleep, go through the rest of the day, go through practice, a little bit of anxiety creeping up in my mind, but I'm still thinking, what happened on what day? I go into work the next day, I go to talk to Pastor Mike, I go, Pastor Mike, I don't know what I said or what I did to hurt this family or this teenager, but I want to apologize right now. And I wish I could go ahead and say the exact details of the story, but I found a video that perfectly summarizes what that conversation was like, what this anxiety felt like. Let's see this video real quick. So you see a little boy, he's drowning, he's not gonna make it, he's screaming, and then all of a sudden, I'm assuming mom comes over, and he's not even up to his waist. He stands up perfectly straight. That is exactly how our conversation went. He goes, dude, you missed something. Contact them, fix it, and move on. I get it. It's happened to all of us. With all that was going through my mind, I was drowning myself in the shallow waters of anxiety. I was drowning myself in the shallow waters of anxiety when the reality was all I needed to do was stand up. He says, here's how you fix it and move forward. Don't get stuck looking at the past mistakes. Fix it and move forward. I was drowning in these shallow waters called anxiety. Have you ever felt this way before? You're all nervous about something. Your boss puts a meeting on the schedule, and you're like, oh, my gosh, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? And you walk, and you drag your feet in to get a raise. <laughs> it's like, I was all nervous over this, but the reality is I had made this a huge issue in my mind, but it really wasn't an issue at all. This is the trap of anxiety, convincing you that you can't stand up convincing you that you're drowning when reality is you can just stand up. Think about it this way. All of us who drive probably know the feeling of the anxiety when a cop car pulls up behind you. You're a good law-abiding citizen. You have no problem. You've been hitting that left indicator for years. You're a pro at this point. Cop car pulls up behind you. Don't act suspicious. Don't act suspicious. <laughs> Don't act suspicious. You try so hard to act normal that you break four laws in 30 seconds. Why? You're feeling anxious. That is the feeling and trap of anxiety. It's been reported that 18% of people over the age of 18 have reported some sort of anxiety disorder. And somebody came up to me after and said, mm-mm, that's way higher. People just don't realize how anxious they actually are. So I want to answer this question today. How do we deal with anxiety? Is there a biblical answer to this problem called anxiety? Let's read what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians 4 verse 6, here's what Paul says. He says, do not be anxious about anything. I'm going to start that over. Do not be anxious about anything anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Watch this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does that peace look like? The peace of God. So how do we answer this question? How do we navigate this thing called anxiety? We see an answer right here that's easier said than done. The Apostle Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. And what does anything mean? Not even one thing. He's not saying be good 99.9% .9 of the time 
and then be anxious this little bit. He's saying, don't even be anxious about one thing. This verse says, don't be anxious, and then what's it shift its focus to? It shifts our focus to God. It immediately says, don't be anxious, and then it changes focus to prayer, to connecting with God. And I thought about this. Why is this verse written in such a way that it's shifting our focus from anxiety to God? Is it possible today that much of the anxiety that we face in our lives is not rooted in what's going on around us, but it's actually a matter of where we're focusing? Is it possible that we're anxious not because there's things going on in the world, but because we are focusing on all of the wrong things? Feelings of anxiety are rooted in your focus, not facts in the world. Your anxiety is rooted in where you focus, not the facts of the world. And you might be saying, no, 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 no. Mm-mm, pastor. You're wrong. The reason that I feel anxiety right now is that there is a disease known as COVID-19. I am anxious because this disease exists. Well, let me share a secret with you. The disease existed before you saw the first news story about it. The disease itself, it existed before it ever gave you a feeling of anxiety. What happens is we are in a global pandemic. There is no hiding place from this thing, so it's constantly in your face. And when you always see something, what do you tend to do? You focus on it. It is a natural reaction to focus on the negative things because that's how we keep ourselves safe. But the reality is, if we're so focused on problems in the world that we fail to focus on God, that is where those feelings of anxiety begin to truly rise up. I believe that this is why the Apostle Paul can make a huge statement such as, do not be anxious about anything. He's not saying there's no reason to be anxious, because there's plenty of reasons to be anxious. He's saying we all have a better focus in our God. He's shifting our focus to God. Let's break down this passage, because in a world that is always changing, there really is always a legitimate reason to be anxious. If I told you, write down how many times you've been anxious in the last year, I think most of us would say, there's not enough pens on earth to write down the amount of anxiety I felt. Well, what about the last month? What about today on the way to church? What about right now in the middle of this message? Some of you might feel so anxious that the last thing you heard me say was, good morning, church. (laughs) And then you're stuck on the things in your mind. You're stuck on the things that are making you anxious. Well, if that's you, we're all going to do an exercise together. So everybody repeat after me. Say, be anxious anxious about nothing. nothing. Turn to God. God. Now say it a little bit louder. Say, be anxious anxious about nothing. nothing. Turn to God. God. Now this time, close your eyes. Why are y'all looking at me still? Close your eyes. (laughs) What the heck? Make an eye contact like my eyes are closed. No, they're not. Close your eyes. And imagine that you're looking at yourself in a mirror, and now you're encouraging yourself. Say to yourself, say, be anxious anxious. about nothing. nothing. Turn to God. God. Open your eyes. There is power when we shift our focus from our circumstances to our God. I'm going to say that again. There is power when we shift our focus from our circumstances to our God. I love the way that this scripture is laid out because Paul is giving his final encouragement to this church at Philippi, and this is the message that he's giving to them. Watch. In verse 4, he says this, and remember, we're talking about anxiety. We're talking about how do we beat this thing called anxiety today. Look, Look what he says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now the word rejoice here is the Greek word gyro, and it means this, to be glad. 
The word always, if we broke it down, means always, at all times, ever. So what's the scripture saying? Be glad in the Lord always, at all times, ever. What would it truly look like to be glad in the Lord always, at all times, ever? Does it say here, rejoice in the Lord sometimes? No. Does it say rejoice in the Lord most of the time? No. Does it say rejoice in the Lord as long as they get your fast food order right? No. Does it say rejoice in the Lord as long as there's nothing to make you anxious? No. It says rejoice in the Lord always. But here's the hard part about that. I just lost my job, but you're telling me to rejoice in the Lord always. No, you don't understand. My kids are walking away from God. Rejoice in the Lord always. You don't know the amount of stress I feel. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Rejoice in the Lord always. Yeah, but I don't know if I'm going to make it another day. Rejoice in the Lord always. Am I saying today to pretend that there's no issues in our lives? Absolutely not. There's going to be troubles in our lives. But what I am saying is that rejoicing in the Lord is going to be the thing that gives you the strength to go past those obstacles that are trying to tear you down. Rejoice in the Lord always. It's saying always be glad in the Lord. I love that the Bible says Fullness of joy is found in the presence of God. And as I think about this idea of rejoicing and how it relates to anxiety, I realize this very quickly, that it is impossible to rest in God's goodness and be full of anxiety. I'm going to say that again. It is impossible to rest in God's goodness and be filled with anxiety. You cannot be at rest and full of anxiety. It's or. You're at rest or you're not. You're at rest or you're not. And what's the difference? Where are you focused? What are you fixated on? When you are rejoicing in God and being glad in him at all times, always, ever, you are focused on him and his goodness. It's so funny the answers that God gives us in his word that it's just staring right back at us. It's so funny that this word anxiety or anguir means to choke or to squeeze. It gives me an image of somebody that's bound up like a captive. And the Bible says that Christ came to set the captives free. It's so funny that anxiety tries to steal your rest. My nap was done in my story. The second I felt anxiety, I could no longer rest. Anxiety tries to steal our rest, and Jesus says, come to me. All of you who are feeling burdened and heavy, and I will give you rest. Come to me all who are filled with anxiety, and I will give you rest. It's almost as if the issues that we face in our lives have a solution, and his name is Jesus Christ. It's almost like Jesus is the master key to the life's problems that we face. And you might be here today like, oh, come on now. You really are expecting me to go from a life of anxiety, to changing my focus, and now I'm going to be at peace? Well, I want to argue you've probably done it before, because I've definitely seen it in my own life. Anybody here ever met somebody that always has an attitude, or they're always full of anxiety, whatever negative feeling it might be, and then their birthday comes around, and all of a sudden, it's my birthday! Ah! It's my birthday! Ah! Chase messages you, you only have $15 left in your account. Perfect, I'm going to get my nails done. It's my birthday. Woo! Now you tell me, is the clock striking midnight on the anniversary of this person's birth, a superpower that gets rid of all of life's issues? No, it's not. 
But what happened? They found something to rejoice in. My birth is worth rejoicing in, and because I'm going to rejoice and celebrate my birth today, I'm no longer focused on the $15 in my Chase account. Well, I want to give you a secret. We have something worth rejoicing about every single day. Rejoice in the Lord always. When we're celebrating God, we're rejoicing with God, we're worshiping God at all times ever, guess what we're not focused on? Those issues that are trying to tear us down. It is always worth being glad about God and the things, not only that he's already done, but the things that he is doing in our lives. Maybe you're saying, it's so hard for me to rejoice in the middle of a situation, in the middle of a circumstance. Well, I want to encourage you to look back at the things that God has done for you already. When the people of Israel were crossing into the promised land and they crossed over a river and they're ready to walk right into it, God tells them, hold on. He says, turn around and go and grab some stones. And he says, grab those stones as a memorial for the things that I've done for you today. And many times I feel like in life when we have, we're thinking about the situations that we're in and we feel like we have nothing to praise God about, if we would look back at all the times that he's delivered us, we would have more than enough to praise God about. Rejoice at all times ever. It's very difficult to look at the good things that God has done in your life and focus on the bad things going on around you. When we rejoice, it is a natural shift of our focus. Let's keep reading. So verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And then this next verse just confused me. He goes from rejoice in the Lord always, then he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. I was like, what? How does that make sense? It's like when you're typing up something and you accidentally backspace a paragraph and it puts two paragraphs that don't have anything to do with each other on top of each other and it doesn't make sense. That's what this feels like. You're telling me to be glad in the Lord always and let everybody know how reasonable you are. Let everybody see your ability to reason. Just as a quick anonymous survey, whoever has worked with an uh, unreasonable person, who here lives with an unreasonable person? Don't do it. Put your hands down. Put your hands down. It ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. When someone is unreasonable, when you see the way that they react, you're, you usually write it off like, oh, there goes Jerry. There goes Tommy being unreasonable again. I'm trying to find this connection between reason and anxiety or rejoicing and reason. And as we keep reading, we see the key in the scriptures. Watch this, verse 6, where we started. It said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Watch this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding... This can also be translated, the peace of God that surpasses all reason will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now imagine this, everybody sees how reasonable you are. When something happens, you react in a reasonable way, whether it's something good or something bad. Everybody knows that you're a reasonable person. And then your life begins to fall apart. Everything starts to turn downhill, and the people around you know that your life is falling apart, but they also know that you have this sense of peace, that you're relaxed in the middle of a storm. People are going to wonder, say, hey, I see that your life is falling apart, but you're still at peace. And they're going to ask you, why do you have a sense of peace? The reason is that God's peace surpasses all reason. God's peace surpasses all understanding. And when I saw this, this blew my mind. He's saying, set your life up in a way where if things go bad, there is a peace that goes beyond the reason that you're known for. 
If everybody knows you for a reason and then they see something that surpasses that reason, they're going to be curious. So if we look at this passage and we summarize each sentence, it looks something like this. Be glad in the Lord at all times ever. Be known to everyone as a reasonable person. Shift your focus from the things that cause anxiety to the things of God, and the peace of God that surpasses all reason will guard your heart and guard your mind in Christ Jesus. In a world that is filled with anxiety, we have an answer to anxiety, and his name is Jesus. There is a peace that exists that doesn't make sense. And that peace is found in Jesus. In my story at the beginning, my mind, when I got that text message that said that I messed up, went to all the negative possibilities. I'm searching a database in my mind to see what wrong, went, went wrong. What did I do wrong? The reality is my focus was on the wrong things, and because of that, I was filled with anxiety. I was focused on the wrong areas instead of focused on God, and because of that, I could not see or think clearly. So it's clear that anxiety is rooted in focus. So all right, is there a solution to my focus? What is the Bible going to tell me to do with my focus? Watch what the very next verse says. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, I tried to read it and it was in Spanish. I was like, nope, back to my thick. <laughs> whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And not only tells us where to shift our focus, it tells us what things to think about. Watch verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. When people see the peace that surpasses all reason, they're not just seeing a calm person. They're coming into contact with the God of peace that is with you. They're coming into contact with the God that is at work in your life. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise, think about these things. Imagine getting into a heated argument with somebody that you care about, with somebody that you love. And then you take a moment and you take a step back. And you do what the scripture says. You think things about them that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. You can't focus on the gift that somebody is in your life and be angry at them and hate them. You can't focus on all of the good things that have been there across the years and be so fixated on a small argument over what type of toothpaste to buy that you're going to hate this person in this moment. Think about the things which are good. Now let me ask you a question today. Who controls what you think? Who controls what you think? If you open up your phone and hit the camera and you face it to the front facing, it'll give you that answer. You control what you think, and what you're thinking about is what you are focused on. And if what you're focused on can bring life or give you anxiety and you control what you think, then who has power over anxiety? You have power over anxiety. Maybe you feel like anxiety literally attacks you, like there's a person named anxiety that you are a victim to. I want you to know today that you have power over that thing called anxiety. You have the power to shift your focus to the things which are honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. 
I want you to know today that you have the power to focus and fix your eyes on the things which are above, not the things that are just in front of you. We were singing today, I exalt thee during praise and worship. And the word exalt means to raise to a higher rank or a position of greater power. If you have an issue in your life and you have God and you begin to exalt him, what aren't you looking at? You're not looking at these problems anymore because your eyes are fixated on the things which are above. Watch what Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says. Therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, strive for the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind or set your focus on things above, not on earthly things. Exalt your focus to where Christ is seated. My main idea is simple today. Your focus fuels your future. Your focus fuels your future. Now, is that focus going to be on things that bring anxiety or on things that bring us peace? That's all of our decision to make. Nobody can make that decision for us, but your focus fuels your future. The truth is, when I woke up from my Holy Ghost nap, I did not need to feel a single ounce of anxiety. I did not need to feel stress. I could have went right back to sleep. Well, if I'm going to lose my job, I might as well be rested when I lose it. I did not need to feel an ounce of anxiety. I could have immediately shifted my focus to the things which are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. The moment when that, that anxiety, that anguish, that squeeze began to creep in, that was the exact moment when I should have shifted my focus to God. Now, please hear me today. I'm not saying that we live in a fairy tale where there's no issues in this life. Because even Jesus said there's going to be troubles in this world. But then he said, take heart. I have overcome the world. That is the key. It's not that there's no longer going to be circumstances. It's that we know the God over any circumstance we could possibly face. In those moments when circumstances creep up, I want to encourage you to rejoice in the Lord, to be glad in Him. If you can't see a reason to in the moment, I want to encourage you to look back at what He's done and to look at His promises to you. If you feel like you really struggle with anxiety today, I want to remind you that when you're focused on Christ and you're resting in his goodness, that those feelings of anxiety, they're naturally going to go down. That when you focus on Christ, the peace that surpasses reason will not only guard your heart, but it will guard your mind as well. So in a one-sentence summary, where I put my focus today Put your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I want to encourage you that if you feel like you're drowning and you feel like you're holding on to the rope, you feel like you're trying to pull yourself up with all your own strength to be like the little boy when his mom comes over and puts his feet down and stand on God's word. I want to encourage you to stand on God's promises. Because when you realize and remember the size of the God that you serve, those problems begin to look a whole lot smaller. And if you're here today and you're saying, okay, I know that there is God, or I don't know who God is, I want to encourage you today that there's an opportunity to meet him as your personal Lord and Savior. If you want to encounter this peace that surpasses understanding, I want to encourage you today to give your life to Jesus. And we all pray a prayer together. It goes like this. It goes, Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart. 
come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, is there anybody here that prayed that for the first time? Could you wave at me so we can celebrate with you? Is there anybody at all that made that decision for the first time? I see you. Anybody else? Congratulations for those who made a decision to follow Jesus. If that was you today, I want to encourage you to stop by the Welcome Center and grab our book titled Welcome Home. We would love to help you on, our, on your next steps with Jesus. Let's say a prayer before we head out today. Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name, and Lord, I thank you for everybody represented in this room and viewing online today. Lord, I thank you that your peace that surpasses all reason would guard our hearts and guard our minds as we focus on you, Lord. I thank you that everything that we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a good week. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.